question. But today I'm going to talk about these reports that we have going back to 1881 from the U.S. National Museum. When the Smithsonian was very young in the 19th century, we had one national museum, and it included art, culture, history, technology, and natural history. Everything that is now split into the separate museums was in one museum. And in the 1880s, uh, in 1881 to be exact, we opened a building for the museum. This is the first U.S. National Museum building, which opened in 1881 and was the first National Museum of the U.S. It's now known today as the Arts and Industries Building. And as this new museum opened, they organized the museum into all these separate departments, and they began to formalize uh, the process of doing monthly reports. So we have this collection of handwritten in the 19th century monthly reports. Uh, the 19th century, from 1881 to 1897, they're monthly for every one of the different divisions, such as uh, geology or history. Uh, and then later on, uh, 1897 onwards, they become annual reports, so they're not as frequent. And then that's through 1930. And then beginning in 1930, when the collection isn't organized by department anymore, it's organized by year. So in the early years, you can go through runs of a specific department you might be interested in, but later it's going to be the whole museum. And these end in 1964 for a very specific reason. By that point, we had been breaking up into separate museums, although there was still this umbrella national museum. But by 1964, that was disbanded, and they all became separate museums. So reports would go to individual museum directors after that. But these early reports are just wonderful. Actually, through 1964, they really are very personal views of what went on in each one of these divisions, what their daily work life was like, what their problems were, what their challenges were, what their accomplishments were. Um, and they're written in a very personal tone of voice. And any of you who worked on the field notebooks, it's a similar type of thing where you can sort of get to know the person. Um, and uh, I'm going to just highlight a couple of those collections quickly. Uh, these are from 1881, right around that time. It's Division of Ethnology, and it's written by the curator Edward Foreman. And he's talking about what's going on in that division. And we hear about all the collections coming in. But he also gives us a look at how they take care of the collections because they're experimenting with what they can use to write collection numbers on each of the artifacts. So he reports in here what these different formulas were, how they applied them, how they seemed to do. Uh, did they stay on? Were they visible? Did they get blurry? Well, this is very important today because the conservators and the curators want to know what is that substance that has been put on that object how can we take it off and put something better on today? Or can we say, OK, that is fine to leave like that? So having this information about exactly what they were putting on these objects and how they were putting it on, and that they're using a type of glycerin to hold it in place, this is very important to know for the care of our objects today, which we might not have found before. So they're still very important today. Uh, and. Uh, so we're, we still use these. And they also contain, and this is a little hard to see, it's very faint, but they contain wonderful drawings of objects as well, so you learn something about them. If you start looking at them close, this one has what look like staple holes in the center. And uh, what that is is they didn't use staples back then. That was probably from a, a, a long pin because they would pin them together. And when you work with archives from that period, you need to stay on your tetanus shots because you often would get jabbed with this rusty old straight pin. Now, the collections kept growing like crazy through the end of the century. And by um, 1897 or though, this is what the ethnology workroom looked like in the Arts and Industries building. Stuff everywhere. And you can see in the reports, the curators are complaining that they just can't keep up with all the stuff that's being sent to us by 
expeditions by the various expositions people are bringing things and giving them to us and by something called the Bureau of American Ethnology. So you can just see they're just overwhelmed with piles everywhere trying to make some sense of this. So it is fun to have both the pictures and the notebooks corroborate each other about this just onslaught of collections coming in and trying to deal with those. Now another one uh, collection is the uh, Division of Photography. Now photography is very new and uh, in 1869 we hire a photographer, Thomas W. Smiley, who stayed with us for the rest of his life until 1917 when he died. So he spent 48 years at the Smithsonian. Now at first he's just working as a photographer, photographing the objects. Sometimes the photographs are used in publications or at expositions and uh, or of the buildings and the people here. But over time, he becomes very interested in the history of photography. So by later in the century, he starts collecting or early photographic apparatus, the different plates that you use, different examples of early photography. So we have in, in the Smithsonian a wonderful history of photography collection. And we can see um, his report here. Uh, from 1897, and he's talking about trying to balance both the photographic work that he has to do for publications and other things and to document the objects and trying to collect for the History of Photography collection as well. So he's basically two, doing two very demanding jobs, and he is letting them know that he needs more help if he's going to be able to do this. Um, but uh, so we often see what the challenges are uh, for these curators in that time period. Uh, so he um, really gives us a sense of what he's up to. Now some of the other ones uh, that will come later you might find kind of, they might look to you like they're not very interesting. And these would be, for example, the reports after the turn of the century by the curator of the Division of Fishes, one Barton Bean. And my oral history interviews of staff have shown me that he was probably the least productive curator ever to work at the Smithsonian. I have ever, never heard a good word about him. And he uh, did something that was known as the two hat trick. He had two hats, so when he walked in the morning, he'd put one on the peg near his door so it looked like he was there. Then he went behind this little screen he had, took the other one out, his, out of his drawer, and went out the back door, and spent most of his days at the pool hall and drinking. And then he'd come back and kind of doze off for the rest of the afternoon. And I have so many tales of what a useless curator he was. Uh, and so you really wonder, could he have been that bad, or did people just not like him? But one of my students, grad students, is doing the, his the history of fisheries biology right now. And she's looking at Barton Bean's annual reports that are in the curator's annual reports. And unlike the other ones that just are, there are questions that are asked, and there'll be pages answering all these details about what came in, what field work you did, that sort of thing. All of Barton Bean's answers are, Nothing to report, nothing to report, nothing to report. You know, who came to visit? Nothing to report. What did you publish? Nothing to report. You know, what was your best new acquisition? Nothing to report. What did you put on exhibit? Nothing to report. So even he made no attempt, uh, apparently, to pretend he was doing much of anything at work, which you really find quite astounding at the Smithsonian. But it, these curators' reports do corroborate what was told to me in these oral history interviews, that this guy just didn't do any work. Some of the younger curators really enjoyed um, taking straws and spitballs and kind of waking him up when, in the late afternoon when he's asleep at his desk. But it's just kind of, and, and if you say two hat trick, everybody goes Barton Bean. So it is quite interesting to see that the curators' annual reports, they might look boring to you, but they're very interesting to us because they do verify that this guy didn't even make an attempt. Now, you think, why doesn't he get fired? Well, he doesn't get promoted, 
Uh, the director can't get rid of him because his family is very politically connected. When he first came there, his brother was a noted scientist at the Smithsonian, his older brother. And while his older brother's there, they're getting a certain amount of work done. But his brother leaves at the turn of the century. And after that, he makes no attempt. Now, at one point um, later in his career, the senator from his home state writes to demand that the Smithsonian promote him. And the very gentle-hearted director of the museum at the time, Alexander Wetmore, writes back and says, basically, while I am alive, Barton Bean will never be promoted. He couldn't fire him because of his political connections, but he could refuse to absolutely promote him. So um, it does give us interesting information about our good employees as well as our bad. But for the most part, what you're going to find is these people working very, very hard to keep up with this flow of collections and take care of everything and all their visitors and do all the work that needs to be done. So they are interesting. But you see the level of commitment. Um, and for the most part, it's very hard work. But he is the exception. So um, when you see these, um, it's really helpful to um, put them in context uh, and understand what these are, that these are these separate divisions in the museum, that they change over time, but they're still giving you the whole history of that department or that division. Um, and you're getting to see, for curators, to understand the history of their collection, why something was collected and why not, they're very, very helpful. And curators actually use them all the time. I have many, many researchers who use them, who are doing history of museums, history of museum practices, or like the Division of Fishes person, history of a specific discipline in the museum. So um, what we'll do is go to some questions now. Uh, so let us know if you have any questions. OK, we have a question from Amanda Guzman, who asks, what is the best way to begin research on curatorial reports? And there's a part two. What range of publications exist on the history of Smithsonian and its various museum units? OK. Uh, if you're familiar with the Biodiversity Heritage Library, and we can put a link to this. It has the published annual reports of the Smithsonian. Now, they are much tighter, uh, much more compact, and they don't give you the personal details. But it would give you an overview of who's in that department and what they did that year. So if you read the annual re report, the published annual report, you'd have a lot of background knowledge for transcribing the far more detailed curator's annual report. Um, and then we do have uh, bibliographies on the history of the Smithsonian that you can look at online if you go to the SI history part of our website. Uh, there is a page for the United States National Museum, and it does have recommended reading. So we can send you, we can post to this group a link to that bibliography. But for example, in 1896, uh, this enormous book was published by the director of this museum, George Brown Goode, called the Half Century Book. And that was because the Smithsonian had been in existence for 15, 50 years, 1846 to 1896. So it's the first half century. That is also digitized and available through Biodiversity Heritage Library. So it's just wonderful. So you can see the history of each of the different departments of the Smithsonian in that book. And that's also very good for giving you an overview. And both of them will give you a lot of the names and specialized terms that you might need for that. We have another question from Siobhan Leachman. Do you get a feel in the reports of the relationships between curators and administrators within the Smithsonian? Definitely. You get a, um, a feel for that. Because sometimes you can just hear the frustration over the lack of space, the lack of drawers. They are all, there's, I call them space wars at the Smithsonian. Collectors always want more storage space. It's as simple as that. They want more 
space, they want more storage units, they want more drawers to put their things in that go in these specialized storage units, or they may want to do field work, or they may be just overwhelmed, like you saw in that picture, of the amount of things coming in. Um, so you'll see that, uh, and you'll see the frustration build up over time before they actually get some more space or get some more um, uh, uh, resources to help them out. For example, in 1910, the, what we now know as the Natural History Museum opened. So part of the collections left Arts and Industries and went to the Natural History Museum. It's still called the U.S. National Museum at the time. And so people had more space for a while. So you see that kind of relax a bit. Um, but then, um, for example, in the 1930s, the other thing that happens is Smithsonian is very active getting WPA employees during the Great Depression. And so what you see them talking about how helpful it is to have this extra staff who can help them catalog records, who can put things in the right boxes and arrange them properly, but also talking about how much time it takes to supervise these new people coming and going all the time so that it's work but, you know, good work that they're actually getting to. And you hear that satisfaction that they were able to accomplish this, you know, work on their card catalog, things like that. Okay, so I want to really thank you for listening to us today and for your work at the Transcription Center. It is just the most amazing and awesome project for all of us across the Smithsonian. So um, we encourage you to go to the Smithsonian Transcription Center and try your hand at transcription. And you'll see lots of different projects, uh, Freedmen's Bureau records. There's also a wide variety of things available, but also these curators' annual reports where you really get a feel like you're almost working back in the museum back in those years. So thank you for listening today.